All right, so what I want to do next is shine the spotlight on the work of one social neuroscientist who does work on adolescent development. Now, there's other people I could also talk about, but I just thought it might be nice to kind of just look a little bit more into detail of, of this particular neuroscientist's work in adolescent development as sort of a way to showcase the way you could use social neuroscience to understand adolescent development. And that person I want to focus on here for a bit is Sarah Jane Blakemore, who's at Cambridge University in the um, Department of Psychology there. Blakemore actually got her PhD from Oxford, I believe, and she worked with a guy named Chris Frith there. You can see here that she's holding up a book that she wrote called Inventing Ourselves, The Secret Life of the Teenage Brain that I'd highly recommend to you. It was a winner of the Royal Society Prize for Science Books back in 2018. She also has a really um, uh, happening um, website here, the Blakemore Lab, where you can go ahead and learn more about the research that they're doing um, and the people are that who work in her lab. So um, I recommend that if you have some time, go check out the Blakemore Lab's website. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and show you three lines of research that come from her lab. The first one I wanted to do is talk about some research that she published uh, in her group in 2021 called The Importance of Friendships on the Adolescent Brain. And you can see that Andrick Becht and other colleagues there are also authors on this paper. And the title of the paper is Beyond the Average Brain, Individual Differences in Social Brain Development are Associated with Friendship Quality. So in this study, they, they looked at 299 Dutch adolescents from puberty to their late 20s. And they looked at them at three time points. Now, I should say that they're not all starting at puberty. It's like some of these participants are 18 when they start, others are 20 or 25. So they have three time points, but they all start the study at different ages, okay? So it's a way to have sort of like a mix of a longitudinal design that's also cross-sectional. And in this study, the two main things I wanna focus on here is they looked at friendship quality so they asked them to fill out some measures of um, the kind of friends they have and how extensive that friendship network is. And then they also looked at MRI scans, not functional ones, they looked at structural MRI scans. And what they wanted to see here is they want to look at key parts of the social brain to see if they change over time and whether or not there's any relationship to their friendship. So what you can see here is um, maybe not in such great detail, but on the left, we have the surface area of four areas, the medial prefrontal cortex, the posterior STS, the TPJ, and the precuneus, okay? And then on the right, we have those same areas in terms of their cortical thickness. So cortical thickness, the lower it is on the y-axis, that means there's more thinning going on, that there's pruning that's been occurring and that the brain is developing more. So you remember I told you this happens in adolescence, that we get, we're gonna get those, that gray matter to decline because of more pruning and more changes that are happening. It's thinning of the cortical thickness. So it's basically like a measure of how much the gray volume is going down. The surface area also tells us this. It means that if you have it going down on the left part of this, these pictures, we're gonna also see evidence of the brain developing that we have more pruning. So we can kind of see how quickly it's changing here. And on the x-axis, you can see different ages going from 10 up to 25, 26, somewhere in the late 20s. And some of these areas kind of go pretty quickly in terms of how much they're changing and others are a little bit slower, but there's just generally this trend. Each of the little colored lines there, you can see there's usually three dots for a line. That represents the three different times that a male or a female in this study was tested. And the blue are the males and the um, yellowish ones are females. And there's really no difference between males and females in terms of how this process goes. Some of the surface areas are a little bit different. There's a difference between boys and girls in terms of their brain size. And so some of these areas might be a little bit different, but otherwise um, there's not really any big gender differences here going across those different four social brain areas. All right, so what did she find in this study? And she and her colleagues, well, first of all, they saw a lot of individual variation in brain development. So this is kind of important to, important point. This is like showing you that if you kind of pick out any one little um, participant there where there's like a line of three dots being connected, that's just one person's um, brain changes over this time period. And you can see that people are, some people are actually changing more quickly. That is that their line drops more quickly. Other people, it's flatter. Um, so it's kind of showing us that at different ages and among different people, there are different patterns in the way in which people vary and how their brain develops. Okay, so it's not like everybody's following the same line here exactly in, in lock sync with each other. They're actually showing lots of variation in their brain development. 
The other thing that's interesting though, and this is the other key finding from the study, is that those people who had faster brain development, which would be indicated by people who have steeper lines going downwards, those people had higher quality friendships over time. Now, by this I mean that they, when you asked them about their friendships, they had these deeper, richer friendships. They were also the people who had faster brain development. Their, their lines were going more down more quickly. Now, it's not meant to be a causal relationship. They're not depicting it here. It's correlational. That is, it could be that people who are destined to have faster brain development are the kind of people that have higher quality friendships to begin with. Or it could be, as a result of high quality friendships, your brain develops more quickly. But either way, we just know at this point that there's a correlation here between faster brain development over this time period and higher quality friendships. So that's one interesting um, finding uh, from that study as well. All right, moving on to a second study. This is a paper that they published in 2012, Blake Moore and Robbins, in which they reviewed studies that mainly came from Blake Moore's lab group, where they compared um, adolescents to adults on risk-taking and mentalizing, okay? So risk-taking, they gave them tasks in which um, adult, adults and adolescents could um, do something risky. Mentalizing means that they um, have to think about what another person's mental state is, right? So what do we see in that review paper? Well, in terms of risk-taking, they looked at ventral striatum activity and they found that ventral striatum actually differentiated between adolescents and adults when they played a risky driving game. And we're going to talk more about this risky driving game at the next lecture. But you can see here that you can make risky decisions while you're playing a virtual driving game. And the adolescents could be doing this with their peers present or alone. Or if you were a young adult or adults, you could also do this alone or have a peer with you. And you can see that in the top there that the adolescents are actually more likely to make risky decisions when their peers are present than they are when they're alone. In fact, when they're alone, they're not actually any significantly any different from young adults or adults in terms of their risky decisions, but having a peer around makes them take riskier decisions. And likewise, you can see that those risky decisions are associated in the bottom graph with changes in their ventral striatum. So when their peers are around them, they're, and they're making these risky decisions, you can see that they're more likely to show activity in the ventral striatum, much more activity compared to when they're alone. There's not really any differences for young adults and adults um, when they have a peer present versus alone in their ventral striatum. So what that tells us is that perhaps part of that risk taking is being driven by the rewards that come from showing off in front of your peers, you know, taking risks in front of them, and that's sort of a, a reward in itself. And so maybe that's what's driving that sort of risky behavior that we're seeing in these adolescents. In terms of mentalizing, they looked across adolescents and they see that there's sort of a developmental shift that happens from anterior to posterior cortical activity when people try to infer, infer the inter, intentions of others. So if you look at young adolescent brains when they're trying to understand the intentions of other people, they tend to use their medial prefrontal cortex to do this. But as you compare this to adults, adults tend to go more towards the fusiform gyrus and the TPJ, the temporal parietal junction, to infer the intentions of others. See that for adults, we tend to focus a lot on the TPJ and the fusiform gyrus to understand empathy and mentalizing and so on. But at this point, when you look at young adolescents, they haven't really started using that part of their brain yet. They're, they're tending to focus more on the medial prefrontal cortex, which as I mentioned to you, isn't even fully developed yet. And that seems to be the place where they are end up using um, the, more of their brain to try to understand the intentions of other people. Third thing I wanna just mention is kind of goes back to that first study that I already mentioned of Blake Moore's that when adolescents don't take risks, it's usually because of friends. So adolescents are generally risk takers. Right? So they take a lot of risks, but the one kind of risk taking that they try to avoid is social risk taking. That is, if there's a chance that they could lose a friendship or not get approval from their friends, they won't take the risk. So they don't want to be excluded. So if you kind of emphasize then that, or focus on the fact that adolescents really want to avoid being cut off from their friends, they really want to be rewarded with them. And then you combine it with some sort of risk taking for more dangerous kinds of behaviors, you can actually get quite problematic behaviors happening among adolescents, right? So if you if the risk taking about some problematic behavior, let's say drinking uh, alcohol at a young age, if that is happening because the adolescent doesn't want to risk being excluded from their friends, because that's the risk they want to avoid is um, being excluded, 
then they're more likely to engage in that problematic behavior if those two things are tied together. And so here's a nice example from that paper that I mentioned there, that, that when you look at different kinds of risk domains, the expected involvement in these risk behaviors is related to how much social benefit they think they're going to get from it. So you can see that aggressive and illegal behaviors are more likely to occur the more the adolescent perceives that there's a social benefit from engaging in that risk behavior. You can see that substance abuse also goes up the more an individual thinks that that's going to be beneficial. Um, there's one thing that's kind of going down there and that's risky sex and you can see their social benefit of being involved in risky sex um, is uh, the, the more they think that there's a benefit of that, the more likely it is that they're not going to engage in risky sex. But the other ones, risky drinking, substance abuse, and aggressive and illegal behaviors, tend to go up the more the adolescent views that as a social benefit by engaging in those risk behaviors. So that's just, again, something to keep in mind that if adolescents are already taking a lot of risks and we combine that with what rewards they might get from their friends, um, you got some kind of dangerous combinations here going on here where you could end up with addictive behaviors or other kinds of behaviors that are destructive to their um, social lives.